I've wanted to happen for a few years now, and it's just tonight that it actually is coming together, so it's kind of great. Um, as Melanie said earlier, this is our sixth and final reading for the year. Um, I just want to thank Melanie for doing this with me because it has made this a very sustainable reading series. And I, we've applied for the grant again. We'll, we'll see if we get it, so we'll see what happens. Um, let me briefly introduce Robert Kelly. So, on January 9th, 2012, over chai and German chocolates up at Taste Buds in Red Hook, I um, was hanging out with Robert Kelly, and he took my left hand and he read my palm. Do you remember this? <laughs> what do you see, I asked him, and he said, success, esteem, good things. You said, someone will give you a bridge and you'll collect tolls for the rest of your life. <laughs> um, I met Robert Kelly 25 years ago, and I didn't study with him formally, um, but I've learned a huge amount um, just in knowing him by his example. So I always say that Robert Kelly was my teacher who was not my teacher. Um, he once wrote the line, a poem must have a door. So my poems sometimes have only mouse holes or pinpricks, um, but you taught me to have the courage to do that. Um, he's a writer that insistently asks why not, to the tune of over 50 books of poetry, fiction, plays, and essays at this point. Um, his 80 years have been constructed entirely out of the senses, out of language and music, and that's really what we should all be hoping for. Um, Robert Kelly is the first poet laureate of Duchess County. Yeah. How cool is that? <laughs> His most recent publications are Voice Full of Cities, Collected Essays, Uncertainties, Opening the Seals, and the forthcoming The Hexagon and Heart Thread. So if you want to check out Robert's poetry at his website, you can look at that at um, the letters rk-ology.com. So Robert teaches in the Written Arts Program at Bard College and is married to the translator Charlotte Mandel. Welcome, Robert Kelly. series that she's running here with Valerie's help can develop in the same way. Um, thank you, Lou. I write every day. My failure is the failure of silence. So when my students ask me how to write, I say, write every day. Quantity turns into quality eventually. It's like playing the, I think, violin. You have to keep doing it. And some of them believe me and some of them don't. And maybe I'm right and maybe I'm wrong. But it's been very important for my practice, insofar as I can dignify my procedures as a practice, to write every day. Usually at the liminal moments, morning, just after waking, just before bedtime, between one thing and another, 
the poetry lives between, it's a really a between, especially in our society, where everything's about something else, and all the real stuff is in between, and you're sneaking its way along. So, um, Anne mentioned recent books. <coughs> There's a book just on the verge of coming out, I have an advanced copy of it, called Heart Thread, which is the fourth in a series of five long poems that have occupied me for the past decade or so. The fifth is called Calls, and it's so on the drafting table. The third is called The Hexagon, that might be out any minute, but any minute tends to be a long minute. <laughs> But I'll read you some from the fourth book afterwards. There's a German phrase that will come up in the middle of the third of the pieces. Each of the half words is a section of 12 lines. And um, Lou mentioned Ashbury. And you know Ashbury's poetry takes delight in writing a four line poem about eight different things where no line connects with any other line in any obvious way. And I'm a little bit uh, taking advantage of that. So these are 12 line stanzas. I'll read four of them, starting with number 187 and going to 190. There's a German phrase that will be occur, occur, and that phrase means work, you healing wave. And then there's a phrase in older English from the poet Christopher Marlowe whose initials are the same as my wife's. So I have to spell the words in the old-fashioned way so you don't think she's telling me that. Lying here, because there is nowhere else ever, the word gave birth to me, and I may have failed the word. Friend's face among the flowers smiling up. The image does not please me. You never can tell what a smile is smiling at. Animal wisdom, I need, I need you near. Only a beast who knows when to turn away. A man, by the nature of time, will walk to the abyss, and Pedicles, master of consequences, vanish in thin air. Hum, hum, him of the volcano. A story broken in half, we hold the stuff, the other part of it, or anything, blows away. The breeze stops when I open my eyes. Someone is watching me, powerful and far. I close my eyes again and doze into gloom. And then I am away with everything else. We live remote and love like sky white, sea green. We imagine difference and live with it. Wave travels into mist, makes island sea. Name it and storm ashore. This is my kingdom of the moment. Eternity of puff of breeze. If I try to walk there, I will never come back. I never come back. He will be safer as a fairy man. Fairy means fairy. It's also like the, the, the Danes. They, they call the fairies the fairy people in Scotland. The dangerous people. Like German Gefährlich, if you know that word. Fairly is dangerous, he mentioned fairly. He will be safer as a fairly man, if men they have or are. He will be a leper man in ordinary land. His voice, the bell, to warn away the fearful, because language is a holy terror, believe me. Hide yourself in the silence of story. There's always some, something left to believe. Dust for sparrows, said the old asleep. He bathed clean in what defiles us. Ah, the light, I've another love, is what defines us. How far inland we've been carried by the wave, left where no other wave can come, lost among friends in a house of one's own. Poet, Here's a work the seamen in you. Not war, but warbling. Kiss the girls and make them cry. Tell the holy rapture of the local mind. 
and I want to try it. Gabriel, renew the world. Blow your horn if you can. Shock the Lord that loves into a new place. Mm -hmm. Mother of the mind. The play of light all over. The light was like a woman in the trees, man on the rock. And in our little tears, the mountain spoke. A fleet of do's and don'ts, a sail of the lucid now. I am a hole in your pocket. Your hand can't leave me alone. Well, mostly what I'd like to read you today is from a, a work I just finished, a, a collection of books I just finished the other day. Um, in this room, surrounded with the visible remnants of the high period of American music, the jazz of the 30s and 40s, or that, that particular high period, I have to confess that Lena Horn was my first one. <laughs> I think it was even less than it was my second. Uh, this was not the music that mattered to me. The music that mattered to me was classical music. I grew up with opera and things like that. And amongst the classical composers, the one that was constantly being played on the radio was Franz Rose and Haydn. Oh, I hate it. <laughs> Boring, academic. Stupid, everything I was afraid to turn into, and so probably did. All the, all the, the endless verbiage of his music. 104 symphonies, how can you? 104 symphonies. But Beethoven, the greatest mind that ever lived, wrote nine and a half. Um, well, I didn't bother me. But I really can't blame him. What I would say as a young man, well, I don't get around, I'll listen to him when I'm 80. <laughs> and then, one day, you know, and that very week that I was 80, the evil conservatory of music at Bar decided to start its Heidi project. <laughs> so what could I do? As a result, I've been writing to all the music they play. And I had to write to it. Now, by writing to it, I mean this, and it's a practice I recommend to anybody who likes writing. The minute the music starts, you begin writing. The minute the music ends, you stop. And in between what you've written is your text, your poem. You don't write ever about the music. You don't talk about it. You let it drive you forward. You put it, as with any source, behind you, like Lil Wayne, 15 years to answer the, the, the prompt, so to speak. You wait, you get it behind you and let it push you forward. So I'm gonna, I'll read you a few of these. I'll read you a few of these hiding things. Hmm. This is the very first one. The trio. Hoboken number 15. Hoboken was the man who just didn't give the height of Capitol. So this is the very first movement of the first piece that I did. I don't know him, though he's at the door. Says he's my uncle. Wears a hat just like an uncle would wear. Green feather, brown feather, <coughs> tucked in the brim. He's carrying something. A fine fish, it seems. Fluke or striper, wrapped in newspaper. But all the paper, the news in it, when I spread it out, I forget the fish. There is news of what's to come. A new king in Baluchistan. And it turns out that unhired speakers are the best communicators with visitors from our science. And the cartoons, cute cats, graveyard antics, a little boy playing that the flute sounds fickle, can't make a song. But we are happy with our present moment. And all over the country, people are spelling better and better. You'd call it a miracle if you didn't read the editorial explanation. And you didn't, because it's time for the fish. Scary, gutter, pray quietly with tears in your eyes for this, about this poor sea citizen you're going to eat. 
She had her friends, maybe. Even this bulky gent who claims to be your mother's brother. He looks nothing like her. Nothing. Barely speaks English, and yet, and yet, something about him. Weeks of pinochle. <laughs> Bad jokes. Legs cramped from sitting too long at the dining room table. Thanks, Gary. That's, uh, that's the first one. Here I'm not going to take from the Duvet, and then doing an E flat major for string quartet and two horns over scheme number three. I'm going to go with 12, 23. Got it? Okay. <laughs> <coughs> I'm trying to be nice to have them. To have them. <laughs> Open your hands. The trout stream ripples by. The apple tree needs a gentle whack or two to remember flourishes. Or do we all? Open your hands and let the world fall. It needs at last to be free of you. Watch them scurry in a way to hide beneath the fallen leaves. Your truths, your fabulous certainties. Smart as Hafiz at the tavern door. Or we'll all be Turks before the end. Hurry is what I'm saying. The horn calls in the woods are frightening the deer. The hunters are moved by some strange tenderness for what they kill. Second movement. But the stream, come back to the stream. Watch the intermittent fishes. They love to flash by. The silvery linearities, those dancers, lie alongside the axis of flow. But don't go yourself. Watching, watching is travel enough. And count the fish and then forget the sum you reach before the sun went down and you stop counting or watching or seeing or being anybody at all. On the sweet nothingness of sleep, that stream that slips everything away. Except that horn you can hear far away makes you dream. You too are a deer. You too are on the way. And the third move. I didn't mean to scare you. You won't die for many decades yet. A little cough, a little sneeze, and you'll get back. You're fine. I only meant to tell you how much I love you. Yes, I admit it now, out loud, in the presence of music, in my mother tongue, Coram Popolo, it all is true. The coughs, the sweetness, the goings on, the tender reminders that you are mine. Each love utters, caring more than all the world around it. Nothing so sweet as this, nothing so near to the essence of what it means to be at all. I mean, to be is to be with you. That's what I've been twisting around in mind to tell you. You are love itself, yourself. And these sentiments of mine just leaves on trees. Trees. No, just little bushes fluttering the landscape of this sleepy mind. But all of them are true enough to give to you. If you were awake now, I'd like you to be quiet, just thinking all this towards you. But as it is, I can palaver on and on with no one the worse for it but the words. The poor words themselves. Those tortured ones, twisted strings, sad little violins. Wait now, wait now, love. I promise I will be always yours. I will even be silent now. One of the, the most boring parts of his music to me were his songs. And uh, they did a number of them. And this one I had to hear and listen to. And it's called Abate Zukot, or Evening Song to God. I'd really love to love you, but I need something first. Some vines come down the tree and loop around my wings. 
they hold me tight, polite the way I may one day come to hold you, but for now I need to run the meadow. I need to be like God and love everybody and live alone in nobody's house. Let me live my way to love and then we'll see. We'll see how we are. And if it happens you're still here, still watching me through leaves, and still like what you see, well then our conversation will quietly begin. Not even rabbits will be afraid, and the shadows of evening then will be so puzzling enough for us. <coughs> Does that seem so sad to you? I can't help it. I was born here where the wind comes from, and where all the animals sleep. So I'll read this. Um, one of the pieces of Haydn I actually do like, do love her, is the seven or eight string quartets called The Seven Last Words of Our Lord on the Cross, The Seven Last Words of Christ. And uh, 20 years ago or something like it, I was asked by the same bar conservatory if I would write poems for each of those seven last words, and I did and they were performed as such. But I hadn't listened to them the way I'm supposed to listen to these, so I had to listen to them all over again and write differently. And this is listening to the second word, the word that says, in, uh, in, in English, he calls it in Latin, but in English it would be a man, and then I say to you this day, thou shalt be with me in paradise, which is what Jesus says to the good thief. But that's not what the poem is about, but that's where it was. Stranger, I have sat on this boulder in the morning sun every day for 40 years and never saw you come this way before. Tell me who you are and what you need. I think I am no one you've ever heard of. I am meek, kindly when I can, and I have been walking a very long time. Is this a city you have behind you? Are there people who need what I am or what I think I am? What is that, traveler? What do you carry with you to teach or impart? Are you a wizard with wooden feet, a founding prince, an avatar from some religion we don't want to know? I am a physician. I heal the healthy. I put the sick to sleep. The blind, I tell stories they can see in the dark. Matters of this way are being loved, caressed by every passing breeze. And mothers who have lost their sons, to them I explain the far side of the moon, the role the dead young men are playing gladly with silver chords and soft guitars. The fish know something, but mostly run away. The wind knows it too, and comes and goes. We're the only ones who keep trying to stay. Look around. Is this a place for the likes of us? You and me, we're just passing through. Two minnows who pretend we have a place, and here it is. How wrong we are. But so good and swift, our little thought, dark from given the conclusion, guess the answers even before the questions, try to stand still and have something to say about sun and moon and centuries, before arms timid shadows scurry through the underbrush. And there we go, who used to think we are. So, 
the end of the high and cycle, oh, the golden cycle of the So I'll read a couple of very recent poems to prove. It's a poem of April, that is, this month. Listening to a lecture in a foreign language that turns out to be my own. Joy is a piece of wood. Polish violence until it shines, call it an Iliad. A flower like that smells of molten steel. As it cools, it forms thousands of tiny crystals. These are diamonds. Revolution is the intellectual's name for a bloodbath. Diamonds, literally, since it's steel, is iron plus carbon. Diamonds are pure carbon. Iron is said to keep riches at bay. What are the actual means of production of words? How to seize these means? Do workers seize the means? Who are the workers? Freud dreamt of a red chrysanthemum and asked it why. Its color contradicted its name. A flower didn't know. Goatskin, cape, and fresh water in its calabash, the poet addressed an empty room. He spoke with an elegance equal to the slight perturbation of the air in that enclosed space. A lampshade that changes the language spoken within its light. Be especially careful on the sofa. And this is a poem called We Need. You need a mirror, here it is. You need a monkey, it ran away. You need a vehicle, a lama gaia descends. You need a new name, God understands me. You need a whistle hanging around my neck. You need an audience, the grass is moving in your wind. You need a house, the wallpaper is peeling. You need a bowl of fruit, the bees are trying to help. You need a glass of water. Here, drink my diamond. You need an albatross to bring bad luck. This ace of swords is the best I can do. You need an organ to fill the church. Remember the pipe sound for plumbing. You need an opera. The soprano has a cold. You need a metro car. The trains aren't running. You need an umbrella. The sky fell long ago. You need some bread. Here is the cheese. You need a good night's sleep. The bed slid down the hill. You need a catalog. One, printing, one painting looks just like another. You need a haircut. The wind breathes. You need some new friends. The doors are all locked. You need a moon over your garden. It's only early afternoon. You need a new coat. We're all naked here. You need a good cry. Everybody is smiling. You, learned, you need to learn French. There is no such country. Um, you know, we carry on about how prose and poetry, as if they were very different. I don't think they were. Really, I don't think you think so. I'm being polite. Maybe I think it's polite. I'm poetry is really polite out of sheer fear. <laughs> um, but I don't think there's such a big difference between prose and poetry. The lines between lines and not no lines, lines and solid text, but the post poems, as I think of them of his, are at least as poetic as the poem, poems of mine, when I read them. So I'm not sure that we have that distinction down there. Um, there's a poet in Michael Eyes who doesn't want anybody to write in lines anymore. That's his latest preoccupation. So I wrote this poem in lines for him, called Helicopsis. Sheepfully, the meadow turned over on itself until it held. Then the small beasts killed, but not disturbed the eat. We had spotted them from the highway time after time until beige and under forms 
sing part of rock and sky, but they are us. We swoon into similarity as the magician's hand spins the spiral car. The thing about hypnosis is we always forget. Hasn't it always been just the way it is now? And if we can just still on the way to being itself? So let me conclude with a uh, a superstition of mine. I would like to read the most recent form of the reader. Good, bad, and different. Don't tell me. <laughs> so this was written this morning, the worshipper. I touched her and her magic fell away. I am intact, only untouched, she said. And we wept together for something lost we could not make or even recognize. Now it was now, and nothing to be done. Thank you.